Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this Wind Power Engineering and Development Webinar, New Solutions to Gearbox Longevity. It's about time, isn't it? All right, I'm your host, Paul Dvorak, editor of Wind Power Engineering and Development Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Now, just a brief agenda before we start. Uh, the webinar will be available at uh, windpowerengineering.com, and a link to it and all the slides will be emailed to everyone. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer session. Of course, not everyone that wanted to watch today's webinar could do so, but you can help them learn, learn from it by tweeting the key points and the takeaways you think important. In your tweets, be sure to include the hashtag WindWebinar. Now, after the presentations, I'll read the questions that you and the audience have submitted. You can do that by typing them into the question box on your GoToMeeting panel that should be on the right of your screen. Okay. And I'd suggest not waiting to the end of the presentation. Type your questions in as they come to you, and we'll try to answer as many as possible before the hour is up. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers, and then I'll turn the microphone over to them. Uh, first up will be David Heidenreich. He is the founder and chief technology officer of PT Tech, uh, an employee-owned company headquartered in Sharon Center, Ohio. David served as president from 1978 to 1995. He's been involved in the power and energy industries for over 45 years and holds more than 25 U.S. patents. In addition to authoring the book, Exponential Solar, in 2007, David heads PT Tech's developmental efforts in areas of alternate energy, and he's a 1965 BSME graduate of Stevens Institute of Technology and a professional engineer in Ohio. And after Dave, we'll hear from Doug Hare. He is the Wind Products Manager for PT Tech. He is extensively involved in the instrumentation of wind turbines for PT Tech. He has 14 years of industrial and manufacturing systems experience and has been working on the wind industry uh, since 2010. He's a graduate of Juanita College in Huntington, PA. And our third speaker will be Deeraj Chaudhry. He's the business unit manager for Parker's Global Renewable Energy Markets. Uh, in that role, he's responsible for the strategy direction and execution of business development activities leading to sustainable growth and profitability for Parker Hennepin's many technology solutions across various divisions and groups. Prior to joining Parker, Debraj was responsible for identifying business at, uh, businesses at Tyco Electronics, where he spent several years in various management positions. Debraj holds a global executive MBA from the Keenan Flagger Business School at the University of North Carolina and an MS in engineering from the University of Massachusetts. He's an avid researcher in sustainability and global interactive networks to a successful enterprise. And with that, let me start with Ms. let's start with Mr. Heidenreich. David, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Excuse me. Um, the title. Excuse me. Here we go. New solutions to gearbox longevity. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm hearing some of you out there saying it's about time. And I'm hearing others saying we've heard that before and it hasn't changed. I think we're going to show you some things today between what PT Tech and Parker has to show that, that really are new solutions. A little bit about PT Tech because we're not well known in the wind industry, but we are well known in a lot of other industries that are really really make some extreme machines. Uh, we spent, uh, we've been in business 35 years. Uh, we have, we spent the 80s mostly underground in underground mining machinery, tunneling machinery, and we developed some great products for controlling the transient torque loads in that equipment. And we had made great strides in improving their reliability and productivity. We did the same thing in the steel industry and in really heavy duty uh, diesel engine drives in the 90s. Uh, diesel engine drives that grind up waste. We uh, controlled the transient torque loads in that equipment far better than had ever been done before. And uh, today we're on all kinds of machinery. Diesel engine drives to, uh, to uh, marine drives, even, uh, even some things on submarines. One, one of the things we've learned in, in working on all these extreme machines is that if you want to really extend the life of the drive system, you really have to address the transient loads. Those are the loads that really cause damage and shorten the life of components in the drive system. So why are all these wind turbine gearboxes being replaced? Is it normal loads or is it the transient loads? I think we're going to show you some evidence that really points to the transient loads and what transient loads 
what those transient loads are. What we've learned over the years is if you're going to solve the problem of transient loads, you really have to understand the true nature of those transient loads. And I'll tell you, even though we've been involved somewhat in the wind industry uh, for, the, for a couple of decades, we never really understood the nature of the loading until this article was printed in February of 2010. The uh, chief technology officer for one of the major uh, bearing manufacturers sent this to us, and it was an eye-opener for us because it really revealed for the first time that there were transient torque reversals happening in wind turbines, and they were caused by a number of different events. And it showed something else that was really interesting. Eric Rizinski, who's the, the fellow that leads the company that did this work, uh, actually instrumented the rollers of a roller bearing to see what the rollers were doing. I want to share that a little bit more with you on that because an understanding of this will give you a real understanding of what's going on in your gearbox. Rollers excuse me. Rollers um, in a roller bearing are loaded in the load zone and they're aligned and they take the load very nicely. But at 180 degrees from that load zone, the rollers are just kind of idling along their they're misaligned within the tolerance of the, uh, the cage that holds them in position. They're going a little slower than the uh, rollers in the, in the load zone. And so when the load is suddenly reversed uh, 180 degrees, which is what happens in every bearing in the gearbox during a torsional reversal, both rollers are not in position to take the load. And they actually, they're, they're skewed. They actually skid as they break through the, the oil film which initiates metal to metal contact, initiates the wear, the pitting, the micro pitting, and eventually the loss of gear alignment. And once you've lost gear alignment, you're, you'll be replacing the gearbox uh, very quickly. Uh, this is a great picture and a great quote uh, by, by Eric. Um, and uh, the picture really shows the uh, the micro pitting, the pitting, uh, even the, some of the gray staining in the middle of the roller, but the ed you can see the edge loading on those rollers and the fact that those rollers have s that they've seen that edge loading is a, is a sure sign that these rollers are being uh, stressed while they're misaligned during a, a transient broker reversal event. So I'm going to turn this over to Doug now, and uh, he can talk to you about some of the equipment that we have developed uh, to address this um, uh, since we read that article. In order for us to truly understand what was going on in the drivetrain, um, we had to be able to measure it. So uh, the answer to that was our WinTM torque monitor device. Uh, this is a device that's designed to be attached to the uh, main shaft of the turbine. Um, with a few strain gauges um, to really give us the uh, accurate readings on the torque that is going um, through the drivetrain in real time. Um, again, it's a magnetically mounted device on the low speed shaft, um, and it gives us the worst torsional reversals and, uh, and loads, and also the speed of the turbine. We currently have it um, on five different turbines, uh, four different models from 750 kilowatts to uh, 2 megawatts. So to give you a, uh, an idea of what we uh, are looking at in terms of uh, the results coming out of this device, the, the, uh, on a normal braking event, this uh, graph shows you there's torque on the left-hand side of the graph. Um, time is at the bottom of the graph. Um, you see some important lines. Uh, the zero line is the most important. Uh, the zero torque line that's about a third of the way up the chart um, is really the key point because it's telling you when that torque is reversing across the line. Um, the red line that you see here is the actual torque being measured, and this is a transient event um, in a 750 uh, kilowatt design. So once we got an idea of what was going on in the way of torques, um, we started to think about how do we solve this situation. The um, 
a standard 750 kilowatt turbine, most of the turbines out there have no torque limiters whatsoever. Um, in that kind of situation, it's really the worst case scenario. You have no idea what your loads are. Uh, there's no limit to the loads, either in a forward direction or in a reverse direction. Um, a lot of more modern turbines, more up-to-date turbines, um, have installed torque limiters into the system. That does solve some of the problems. It uh, cuts the transient loads at 150%. That's uh, great for uh, a forward torque event. Um, it, because it's going to uh, limit it to a, a uh, calculated amount that the turbine is likely designed for. However, in the reverse direction, and when it crosses that zero line, that's a major um, concern. So we started to look at this. What if we design a system that could cut those reverse torque loads uh, down to as low as, say, 40% of nominal torque? A simple solution. So our simple solution is the WinTC torsional control. That's an easily retrofitable solution, uh, mounts on the generator shaft, uh, where normally there's a rigid coupling. And it adapts to the existing coupling and spacers. So in our first field installations, you saw in the um, earlier picture, it was on a uh, zero max design. This is on a centilink link design. So Again, adapting to the existing spacer and the existing uh, high-speed shaft. Um, the concept is that you have two large rotating masses. You have, obviously, the large rotor um, that is the large inertial mass. But you also have a generator um, inertial mass that is rotating at, at very high speed. So what we need to have is something that's going to absorb that, uh, those transit, trans, excuse me, the torsional loads, the uh, transient loads. The, um, right now, sitting in the middle of that is your gearbox. Um, that would be a very expensive fuse, and we've seen a lot of damage that has occurred um, because of those transient loads going through. So um, the concept here is really a, a fuse or a snubber that's going to manage those transient loads down to um, within the design specs of the turbine itself. So what did we find when we actually installed our WinCC unit? Um, this is going back to the original graph that you saw. Um, to talk about the results, you see the red line there is the torque in a transient event. The uh, red dash line below the zero line, that is the, uh, what we would call our reverse torque setting, the 40% of nominal. Uh, the blue line up above is the nominal torque of the turbine. And the red dash line would be if there was a forward torque setting, about 150% of nominal. So um, what you see here is a significant shock load going through the system, um, going six times over the um, zero torque line. So with our WinTC installed, we overlay this with a, blue, um, with a blue line, the same event in the same field. This is a separate turbine that had our WinTC installed and our test gear installed. So what you see is with the blue line, it uh, crosses the, uh, the reverse torque setting it gets uh, um, controlled at that point, and it actually never crosses the zero line again. Um, with that, we've minimized the, uh, the misaligned ro rollers seeing the torsional loads. So you can see that it actually uh, dampens the magnitude and the frequency, uh, again, down to a very manageable level. So you may be asking, is this just a NEGMICON issue? Um, as we've uh, put our uh, monitoring gear on a variety of different turbines since that time, we found that it really truly is not a, um, a neg micon issue. It's a all turbine issue. Um, the Nordex one megawatt turbine, um, this is a high speed shutdown, and you can see that this is a significant um, shock load to the system. Um, this is actually as it's, uh, want, it's bringing itself up to speed, getting ready to engage, and it aborts the, uh, the connection to the grid and you see a massive shock load going through the system with over 30 reversals across the zero torque line. Um, these bearings saw a lot of damage during this time. Um, what would have happened had our WinTC been installed? Uh, we will be knowing that soon uh, as this is uh, the next product that's going to see, the next turbine type that's going to see our uh, WinTC. So on a modern turbine, um, on a, this is a Gamesa 2 megawatt turbine, uh, high 
and when shut down, for example. Um, these events do not occur often, but when they do, you can see that the uh, magnitude of the event is significant. Um, it's running along at its normal, um, normal torque, and uh, you can see the shock load actually goes in reverse um, to the, the full nominal torque in reverse direction, and you can see across that zero line um, a significant number of times. Uh, thank you, Doug. Um, the, um, the, tr the number of transient torque reversal events that we've identified so far on generally all wind turbines um, is a, a, pr a pretty uh, amazing list, uh, 10 events. I'd like to say that um, of all the extreme machines that we've worked on, um, the wind turbine is probably the worst when it comes to the number of events that can cause some really nasty transient loads. Um, I, I, we've ne never seen anything with a list like this, and, and really reverse torque uh, loads like this are really unusual in virtually all equipment. It's really pretty, it's not unique to wind turbines, but it's probably much worse in wind turbines than it is in most any other type of equipment. Uh, the older style uh, stall control two-speed turbines, uh, they see uh, additional they see additional uh, events every time the blade tips deploy, contact or engagements, uh, upshifting, downshifting. Um, they see a lot more reversal events, we've recorded those. Um, but these reversal events don't seem to be as severe, but those same wind turbines, those same two-speed turbines, are also subject to all the 10 events that we listed on the previous slide. This is a, a real important slide to take a moment and to understand. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a graph from a ferrous particle counter um, which is uh, something that's been introduced in the last uh, few years and is gaining some uh, popularity for, for good reason because uh, of the ability to predict when a, a gearbox is going to have problems. And uh, D-Rog is going to talk about what Parker has in this area, which is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, but this, uh, this particular graph shows the particles that are counted on a cumulative basis. Uh, in a number of different sizes, uh, over a on the on the horizontal line, the uh, that is a timeline in 10 minute inter intervals, which is the intervals that the actual measurements are taken. Uh, so that's an 80 day period. And what's really interesting about this graph is that you can see that the increases in particles are happening at discrete events events such as transient torque loads, probably probably reverse torque loads where the bearings are breaking through the oil film through their misalignment in a, in a reverse event and, and causing particles to be generated. And the, what's really dramatic about this graph is that over that 80-day period, one emergency stop event accounted for more than 50% of the particles more than 80% of the mass of particles that were generated. So it shows that even though smaller torsion reversal events can cause some damage, it's things like emergency stops and high wind shutdowns that can really cause some significant damage. So we, I, we can say with a great deal of uh, confidence that uh, torque reversal events um, are a significant cause of gearbox replacement. Um, this picture that we show was taken just a month ago at a wind farm, which is, happens to be the wind farm that installed our um, first torque monitors and installed our first wind TC torque control units. And they gathered enough data to see that there's real uh, advantage in this in our product 
And so while they sent about a million dollars worth of gearboxes out to be repaired, they also gave us our first order to start the uh, process of retrofitting the wind farm with our units. And we're excited to, to see this happen. So torque reversal events are, are perhaps also a cause of other problems in the drive system. Um, everything from the tip of the blades to the generators see these torsion reversals. And um, if you know anything about fatigue loading, and most engineers know a little bit, the worse the reverse loading and the more often it happens, the shorter the life of the components. So blades, couplings, generators, in addition to the gearbox, all see these nasty reverse loads. And we have we have some circumstantial evidence where we've had people comment saying gearboxes and blades, they've noticed a relationship between the uh, number of problems and the emergency stops, number of emergency stops they've actually seen. Um, so we are suggesting that people maybe, you know, every wind farm has its troubled, its troubled uh, wind, wind turbines that may have had uh, emergency stops due to control issues or whatever. And if you take a look at those problem children and see if you have more gearbox repairs, blade repairs, uh, coupling generator problems, uh, you might come to the conclusion that this, these transient torque loads are, are being, uh, are contributing to the cause of that. Um, so for, <laughs> for more information, uh, I'd like you to, I'd like to suggest you to talk to Doug. We hope that what we've shown here um, really does change your paradigm on what's happening in your gearboxes and what's happening, happening in your wind turbines. And if you're interested in, in uh, learning more, there's an article that it, it wasn't showing up real good on the screen there, but there's an article that was uh, published uh, uh, in September in Wind uh, Power Magazine that gives you more information about this. You can get it from us or you can get it from uh, the magazine. And, um, and you can also, of course, contact us for more. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to uh, turn this over to DRAJ at Parker and let him explain some of the new products that they have coming along that are intended to improve your box longevity. They've got a really great uh, set of products. Thank you, Dave. Um, Paul, thank you very much for the introduction. That was very generous, and also the opportunity to uh, to present here. And also, thanks to the audience uh, for attending today's session. I hope uh, it's well worth your time. Uh, Doug and David, you guys did a nice job on the presentation. Uh, I think there's some very unique uh, things that happen inside the gearbox from a transient load perspective, and hopefully between what you guys presented and what I present today uh, that it'll, uh, it'll at least give some uh, level of understanding to uh, higher understanding to, to our audience here. So thanks again. Uh, while I'm waiting for uh, to gain control of, of the presentation here, uh, I just wanted to uh, lay out how the presentation is going to flow. So I'll start with a few slides on Parker for those of you who may not have heard about us. Uh, then I'll get in, uh, I'll present some facts and data on the gearbox wear, just like what uh, Doug and David presented. And lastly, I'll get into what Parker does in this field and how we can help prevent expensive failures of the gearboxes or drivetrains and also the downtime. All right, uh, Dearbrush, take another try at uh, taking control of the screen. Yeah. There you go. I'm good. Good. Okay, so uh, real quick, some key uh, statistics for Parker. 
Parker Hannafin. We were uh, founded in 1918 as the Parker Appliance Company uh, by uh, Arthur Parker. Uh, today, we have over $12 billion in sales with uh, almost a million products, unique products that we sell to the marketplace, half a million customers, uh, lots and lots of employees spread around the world, uh, over 14,000 distribution and MRO outlets that you can reach out to and get Parker product lines around the world. And we have over 275 manufacturing plants and 125 unique divisions. So uh, for sure, uh, a complex beast, but uh, what we've tried to do on the front end is really uh, simplify our business into a few groups and into specific markets so uh, we, we can focus better and uh, provide state-of-the-art uh, product lines to the marketplace. So in terms of the uh, operating groups, Parker has eight groups. Uh, other than aerospace, the other seven groups are technology groups. Aerospace is the only one that is market-based because of the uniqueness of the product lines and the contracts that they service. Uh, and these eight operating groups that you see uh, essentially contribute to the top segments that Parker focuses in. And we derive these from the top 10 needs of humanity. Uh, I belong to the energy uh, segment, and energy is probably the most broad because not only is it a segment in itself uh, that's expanding rapidly around the world, especially in developing nations, but it also affects the other nine segments. Uh, you need energy to do practically anything and everything in the world today. So we are excited about this. Uh, my team uh, essentially uh, works in the five or six key renewable energy markets. Wind is the most uh, important for us. It's the biggest one for us. And it's probably one of the most mature ones anyways. Uh, and then we have hydro, solar, bioenergy, geothermal, and now the up and coming, the battery uh, energy storage business as well. In terms of wind turbines, Parker supplies a lot of different products. We supply hydraulic pit systems, uh, hydraulic power packs, motors, pumps, connectors, uh, undersea power cables, the array cables, uh, frequency converters, drives, filtration and lubrication systems, uh, condition monitoring packages, and so on and so forth. In terms of the applications that we focus on on a specific wind turbine, we have five areas, uh, sealing and shielding. So any kind of seals that go inside a turbine, whether it's for pitch or your generator, housing, radial shaft seals, Parker has uh, product lines in there. Uh, pitch and yaw systems, I think I mentioned a little bit to that. Uh, we also work on the drivetrain, the hydraulic hybrid torque converters, and the hydraulic drivetrain. I think there's a couple projects that some of you may be familiar with that have been going on in the US. Uh, power conditioning and storage, and lastly, fluid conditioning, uh, which encompasses the gearbox health management system, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the gearbox cooling and lubrication systems, and lastly, the generator cooling system as well. So uh, let's get into uh, our uh, uh, chat for today. Uh, I picked this up from a, a white paper that was written in Europe by uh, the, the source that you see down on the bottom of the screen. And it was very, very intriguing. It was a very comprehensive paper written around, I think it was three offshore wind farms. And the authors essentially looked at the types of failures, the cost of the failures in these turbines, and then the amount of downtime that these failures uh, uh, created. Uh, and the, the inference was drivetrain failures together account for over 50% of the cost of the failures on these turbines. So gearbox being 19%, generator being 28%. And in almost a all the cases, it's the gearbox that causes the generator to fail because of like Dave was talking about the transient loads that go into the generator. It, it already is uh, loaded from the grid side and then it gets you know differential loads from the gearbox side and hence, hence sometimes the failures. And then same thing on the downtime between the generator and the gearbox over 50% of the downtime was caused by uh, these two 
components as well, predominantly because of the amount of work required to fix these turbines. Once a generator or a gearbox is down, it takes the act of God really to replace one of these two components between, you know, the lifts on the cranes, scheduling it, getting the, you know, the component repaired, putting it back in and getting the turbine to be tested before it gets into full full production mode. So uh, definitely this is not a trivial problem. It's a, it's a very important problem as you all probably see in the marketplace in the wind farms. Uh, the next slide uh, really talks about the warning signals in a gearbox degradation. So it's not like the gearbox is running one, one second and all of a sudden it decides to go up in smoke. It gives out warning signals months in advance if those signals are recorded and those signals are actioned upon with certain things that are maintenance procedures that the turbine owners or service companies can utilize. Now, if you see smoke, I think it's too late. Parker or any other company can do anything about it. It's minutes before the gearbox is going to be toast and maybe even the turbine. I don't think even sprinklers would help at that point. But if you look at the warning signals prior to the smoke, the temperature, noise, vibration, particle size and particle size distribution, you can get pre-warning months in advance and you can do something about it. And, you know, between Dave's company, PD Tech, and Parker, we can help. Uh, this next slide essentially takes that qualitative data um, in the previous slide and puts it into quantitative uh, format. Uh, and I think, David, you had, you had a very good slide on this as well. Uh, this shows you what happened uh, between the first event or what happened at the first event in terms of the particles per minute and then when the second event happened and what started to happen after the second event. There was a three-week window where something could have been done about this turbine before the gearbox went into a catastrophic failure. And... Uh, the following slide further elaborates on this and talks about the number of different particle counts that came about into existence between the first event and then subsequent to the second event. And as you can see uh, in the graph, every single type of a particle had a step change in terms of uh, when, the, when the shock happened, whether it was a uh, a reverse transient load uh, or a torque, reverse torque, whether it was an emergency shutdown or something, uh, some other event. And this slide, essentially what we did is took all the data that we had generated from various turbines and put it in a format where it was easy for us to understand what the difference in the particle size concentration and the particle sizes themselves, uh, what is the correlation between those two as it relates to a benign wear event or a catastrophic failure event? And as you can see, in terms of a catastrophic failure, not only are the sizes of particles being generated much higher, the concentration of wear particles is uh, much higher as well. So it's more number of particles and much higher size of the particles. And what we also saw is once you see particles between 10 microns and 100 microns, a major uh, 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 failure has already occurred. It may not have been a catastrophic failure, but something has broken loose that needs to be fixed right away. So uh, looking at all this data, uh, we also said let's go back and see if we can physically see anything, visually see anything uh, in a gearbox. So we did an inspection and we looked at three different things. We looked at the magnetic dipstick. Of course, it has ferrous metallic wear debris all over that dipstick. We looked at the high-speed shaft roller element and we saw the circumferential surface scoring. Uh, and I think David shared one of those uh, pictures as well. And lastly, we looked at the shaft gears, 
and we saw scuffing evident in those gears as well. So once the, the particles break loose, then they can go anywhere and really destroy a lot of the other rolling elements as well rather than just where it came from or where they came from. So in terms of all this data, what is Parker's philosophy? Uh, we look at the uh, a wind turbine gearbox from a health management perspective rather than here's a loop system system or here's some coolers or here put a particle counter on there and hopefully you'll see something. We break it down into three distinct areas, the diagnosis part, which is the condition monitoring package, uh, the treatment part, which is, okay, so you see uh, something going on, whether it's in the oil or it's in the uh, uh, metallic or in the mechanical components, let's go do something about it. But it all starts with the prevention side. What can we do upfront? in terms of a gearbox to be able to prevent failures like this. And that's where David's company like PT Tech comes in with a torque uh, reversing systems or where Parker comes in with a gearbox uh, uh, health management systems where, and I'll, I'll share some of that data, uh, some of that information with you guys later on. So let's get into the diagnosis part, which is the key for our uh, presentation today. So our monitoring system essentially comprises of two distinct boxes per se. Uh, one's the mechanical system where the oil comes in from the gearbox and then goes out to the oil filter. That's where we put a sampling point and we extract that oil in real time to be fed into our electrical data acquisition system, which is where all the sensors reside. So we bring the power in. Uh, we have a data acquisition package called the TMAC that you guys see on the screen. That TMAC essentially connects with all different types of sensors like moisture, particle counters, pressure sensors, flow meters, uh, online condition monitoring system, and also that data acquisition package can bring in external inputs like the RPM, the loads on the shaft or on the gearbox, on the bearings, uh, wind speed, temperatures, so on and so forth. So once you look, once you buy a Parker package, it would come into come in these two distinct uh, boxes. So the type of sensors we use, uh, a wear debris sensor to monitor metallic, both ferrous and non-ferrous debris within the gearbox oil. And the, what the sensor does is it actually takes all that sample data and breaks it into two distinct buckets, one being the ferrous and one being the non-ferrous. Uh, and that indicates the wear on the gear, uh, gear teeth, whether it's the bearings, whether it's something else, whether it's the shaft seals. Uh, we also use an oil condition sensor, which essentially gives out an overall health picture of the gearbox oil condition. So it's the TAN number or the TBN number, uh, et cetera. An oil cleanliness sensor that measures the ISO codes, whether it's, you know, 16, 14, 10, or 14, 11, 8, or 9. Uh, an oil moisture sensor that looks for water ingression into the oil. Acoustic emission sensors that can be placed on the gearbox bearings, on the gearbox themselves, or even on the generator. And they listen for any rate of change in uh, the noise, whether it's the frequency or the amplitude on the roller elements, uh, or if there's any lubrication issues, so squeaking and stuff like that. And lastly, pressures and temperatures, which measure pressure drops in the system, frictional heat or rate of change in frictional heat in the system, and so on and so forth. And then we take these sensor measurements and send them to our TMAX system, which is the data acquisition package, everything integrated into a single box. And depending upon the sensors deployed, we can take that data and communicate it via an RS-232, 485 milliamp circuits or 0 to 10 volt kind of signals. Uh, into a turbine main control unit or into another data acquisition slash uh, uh, trending package that the customer may already be using. We can also do external communication using a quad band GPRS. So if you want to put a, a wireless or a cellular uh, a device on it, we can communicate to that. And then lastly, we also have switched power and relay output. So if you want to use our system to control what happens in the turbine post an event or post a certain rate of change or post certain limits, uh, 
uh, higher and lower thresholds in a particular data, then we can do that. We can stop the turbine or slow down the turbine or move the pit system away to a less aggressive position to reduce the loads on the turbine. And lastly, all these measured values are available to you through a real-time web interface. And you can set in those alarms, you can set in email notifications, pager notifications, cell phone notifications, or even the, uh, the, the, the outputs to other parts of the turbine to control it. I have an example on the next page that uh, shows what the data looks like. So this one, we did it for 25 days for ferrous particles. And then what I did is I, just so you could see what was on the uh, x-axis and the y-axis, I zoomed it in to four days. And you can see what starts to happen over time in terms of the number of ferrous particles and then also the breakdown of the size of the ferrous particles, how they start to trend up. And that means something is starting to fail uh, in, in that turbine. And you know, so that was the uh, the uh, condition monitoring package. But like I started to uh, to talk through this, it all starts here with the right approach, with a gearbox health management system, which needs to have the early warning condition monitoring package, needs to have the right ratio and types of electrical and mechanical driven pumps. You need redundancy. Lubrication system is absolute key to bearings and gearbox longevity. And you need to make sure that you know, there's, there's some redundancy built into the system so your gearbox will never go dry. Starts with the right cooling system, you know, uh, the cooling capacity, the flow rates, the type of coolers, where they're located on the turbine, whether they're in the back, whether they're up top, are they passive, are they active coolers? Starts with the right filter elements. Do they have the right dirt holding capacity? Uh, what's the pressure drop, typical pressure drop across the filter elements? Uh, are you going into bypass fairly often? Because if you are, then you're not really filtering. You're aggravating the problem because all that metal debris is going to go back into the gearbox. And lastly, uh, this is more for the OEMs where we are now working with quite a few of them on fully packaged systems, not just systems that are available off the shelf to where we actually design an actual gearbox health management system specifically for that turbine for uh, optimum performance, ease of service, ease of use, reliability, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So in conclusion, uh, I wanted to share four of my most important thoughts with you guys. Drivetrain and gearbox failures, as you know, are not infrequent. They are almost always expensive and they cost significant unplanned downtime and hence a loss in energy output, which means a loss in profits for the uh, asset owner. Precursors to failures are now well known. There's a lot of data that we've collected, a lot of sensors that we put out there in the marketplace, and we have proven with high degree of confidence that we can see failures several months up to three weeks in advance. Failures can be prevented. If not, the severity of these failures can be reduced. It's much easier and cheaper to reduce a small component uh, than it is to re uh, replace a full gearbox or a full generator. The right approach to a gearbox health management system is necessary to prevent these failures. And integrating key sensing technologies in the condition monitoring system and then utilizing those outputs intelligently is the key. And then the return on investment for using these technologies and a pragmatic system is extremely short. It's a fraction of one failure on the drivetrain. A condition monitoring system can be fitted cost effectively even as an aftermarket solution. And lastly, a turbine owner should and must request a gearbox health management system on a new turbine be acquired. We are way past the old you know, 225, 500 kilowatt, one megawatt turbines where a lot of the things were simple on a wind turbine. Now the turbines are so complicated. There's so many interactive components and systems in those turbines. There's so much loading on those turbines that a gearbox health management system is absolute key to having a turbine uh, work reliably and uh, flawlessly over, over, the, over the life of the turbine. So with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Paul. Paul, thank you very much.
All right, thank you guys. Thank you, dear Raj, Doug, and David. Uh, well done, gentlemen. Uh, I just got back from a wind power seminar in uh, in Texas, and much of the talk there centered around gearbox maintenance and how to keep them running longer. So let's wrap up with a few questions here from the audience, okay? And I want to remind you, uh, folks in the audience, you can uh, uh, type your questions into the question box uh, to the right of your screen. If you don't see it, look for a little red arrow at the top and hit the red arrow that should be pointing should be pointing to the right. You hit that and it'll It'll open the question box. All right, uh, well, let's start with a. Uh, D. Raj, let's start with a question for you. Okay, um, can the generator be monitored for shocks and faults as well? Yes. So, uh, if you look at the condition monitoring package that I uh, that I discussed in the presentation, there are at least three sensors in that package, Paul, that can be deployed onto the generator. So we can have uh, a, a bearing sensor on the generator. We can also have an acoustic sensor on the generator, and lastly, the temperature sensors in the bearings on the generator, for sure. Okay, very good. All right, Dave, here's one for you. In fact, here's two for you. They're, they're kind of related, so I'll ask them both at the same time. Um, uh, what actually, what actually is a torque reversal, and how how can torque uh, reverse while rotation does not? Uh. Very good question. Um, well, during normal operation, the wind is driving the blades, which are driving the, the drive system through the, through the gearbox all the way to the generator. And the generator is providing the resistance, but the torque is positive and the, and the direction of rotation is positive. If there's, a, if there's a sudden disconnect from the grid, for instance, you don't want to be driving that unloaded generator and, and accelerating out of control. So the the blades either quickly pitch or the blade tips deploy, and now the blades are acting to decelerate the inertia of the blades themselves, but also the inertia of the generator, which is most of the rest of the inertia of the system. So now you've got, you still have positive rotation, but the, the torque in the system is now suddenly reversed, and every, every bearing in the gearbox is seeing a sudden load reversal. And, 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 and as we showed, worse than that, once you set up that vibration of this of the blades, wind, it, it wound up against the generator inertia. Now they start bouncing back and forth, and you have numerous uh, crossing of that zero torque line and causing very significant damage to the gearbox bearings. Okay, very good. Um, let's see. Um, Seth in the audience asks, uh, um, and I think uh, maybe he means without your equipment. Uh, what are some of the means of reducing the number of transient torque events? Uh, uh, I, I, as you look at more modern turbines compared to the old style turbines, uh, there, there's been a dramatic reduction in the number of events, especially just just switching from the blade tip rate to uh, pitchable blades uh, uh, reduce the, uh, the number of events uh, uh, dramatically. But th there, there's still certain events that just seem to be problematic. The emergency stop is really, really difficult to do without seeing, uh, uh, I think, a significant number of, of torque reversals. Uh, we haven't recorded uh, enough of those to, to state for sure, but you know, nobody wants to do those things on purpose. So as we install more of this torque monitoring equipment, we gain more data, we're going to discover all the events. The high wind shutdowns, we've re recorded uh, several of these that are really, really, really nasty events. And these are true whether it's a an older style or a new style wind turbine. The, okay, the control systems can react very fast. The mechanical systems that have to react cannot react in the milliseconds that are required. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Oops, I just lost a question here. Um, See, Jonathan asks, uh, and I think this is for Diraj. Jonathan asks, uh, what's Parker Hannifin's development process for maintenance settings for a new turbine, uh, meaning the warnings and alarms and so on? Yeah, so we essentially, thanks, Paul, that's a good question. We essentially work with the OEMs to figure out where they want to be in terms of their uh, safety factors for the various critical components on a turbine, and in this case, uh, mainly the gearbox and the generator. And then based on that, we can essentially work on, uh, or we essentially work with those guys on creating those thresholds uh, over time. 
So there's lab tests that we go through for a particular turbine or for a particular design uh, for with companies like Winergy or companies like Vestas. And then we go and uh, go back in our lab and implement, look at where the rate of change is or where the step changes are in terms of the shock loads and what that does to the various types of gearboxes or to the bearings, and then we set those thresholds. And a lot of times it's trial and error, uh, but at the end of the day, because these things are fluid, it depends on wind regime to wind regime. We can only offer, hey, here's the guideline, and then based on that, the, uh, the, the uh, wind farm owner or the OEM that has the service contract or the service company can tweak those thresholds to what their comfort level is. Very good. Okay. Um, I think this is one for David again, uh, or Doug. Um, is there a power output reduction consequence when applying the wind TC torsional control? Um, is there less power that's going to be generated? I, I think that's what he's asking. Does if you if you yeah. if the torque reverse if, if the device takes the maybe mitigates the torque reversal, does the does the generator stop producing? Well, it, it's such a, a short-term transient event that the amount of energy that your that it affects would be infinitesimal. Um, the uh, the wind TC is not in a um, shall we say a multi rotation um, slip, so you're not seeing a loss of power because it's only um, it's only basically ratcheting to absorb that um, it, it's shock load. That, that, that's a that's a good point, Doug. The the amount of slip that that occurs in order to snub out this uh, nasty uh, transient torque is only uh, 30 to 60 degrees generally. Uh, so there's, it's, it's a very, very small amount of slip. But it does a very effective job of, of, of dampening that vibration. All right. All right, very good. All right, Adam asks, and this is a long question now, so bear with me. Um, torque limiters are mostly common, most commonly applied to the high-speed shaft. Does that mean that the vibration of the main shaft does not contribute to the gearbox damage as much as the high-speed shaft does? Uh -huh. Very good question. Um, because the inertia of the system is predominantly in the blades and in the generator, uh, the blades being oh, roughly five to ten times the generator and everything else being, being really small, um, anything that happens at, at the high-speed shaft or the low-speed shaft is going to be measured um, uh, is it, going to be proportional. It, the winding up, it's, it's, if, you, if you picture a mass on the end of a rubber band and you're winding up the, the, the mass and you're letting it rotate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it's, it sees it throughout the length of that rubber band, okay? And, um, and if you had three, three or four different rubber bands and they had different uh, sizes uh, to them, they would all uh, see the same general proportional uh, amount. And so the, we think the magnitude, is, even, though, even though we're measuring it in the low-speed shaft, it's also indicative of what's happening at the high-speed shaft. Okay, very good. D. Raj, here's a question for you. Um, Anna, Seth asks, uh, um, do, wind turbine, do wind turbine gearbox oil systems typically have oil filters? Yes. Uh, typically, all gearbox oil filters should have uh, our gearbox oil system should have active filtration. Uh, depends from a turbine OEM to turbine OEM what they like to use. Some like to use all the way down to 5 micron inline filtration. Others use 10 micron inline filtration with a 5 micron kidney loop on the side. But almost all, I would say all gearbox based modern wind turbines today use oil systems that have actual filter uh, filters and filter elements in them of varying micron mesh. Okay, very good. Here, Adam asked a question that I can answer. Is, is it possible to get a copy of today's slides? And yes, they will be mailed to all people who have registered. And then we'll go to a question from Eric, who asks, this is another long question, so bear with me. Given the number and frequency of the torque reversal events, so David, this is for you, is there enough evidence that tur turbines are inadequately designed to meet the long-term life estimates without implementing these gearbox health maintenance systems? <laughs> uh, a question. That's, yeah, that's that, that's um, 
I, I think I think the way I'd like to answer this is <clears throat> all the gearboxes that are used in the wind turbine industry are designed for a 20 or 30 year life, and they're not achieving it. Um, it's, it's no secret that uh, they you know they have a typical life of three to seven years, and maybe the better ones last 10 years. And there's always been something that's happening in that drive system that is defying what normal loading um, bearings um, would predict. And we think this, this article that was done in 2010 really did pinpoint what was missing. When we, when we distributed that to people at NREL and other people, they all said, my goodness, we missed this. And I, and, and I, I think the gearbox people may have missed it too. So I, whether it's fully accounted for or not, we can't speak for the turbine manufacturers. We can't speak for the gearbox people and what they've done. But it, it certainly has been that the problem of gearbox life in wind turbines is more than two decades long with lots of efforts to try to solve it. And I think that this is the first time that this approach has been looked at, the kind of seriousness that we've looked at it, and created the data that, that really supports the fact that this may have been something that was missed. And when, when GL certifies a turbine, um, they they gain a, a series of, of load cases. Um, the issue as we've seen it um, through our testing is it's really that transition. Once again, we're talking about transient loads. So it's the transition between the load cases that is causing a lot of the problems from our research. And, and I'll say one other thing on this. We've talked to the bearing people in, in, in detail, more than, more than one of them, and we talked to the, the technical people there. And we've asked if this could truly be analyzed. And the problem is that these transient torque reversals, there is no good way to analyze what they're doing to the life of the bearing. And uh, you know, I, I would encourage the gearbox people and, and, the, and the, the wind turbine designers to have that discussion and to, and to really find a way to quantify this maybe on an analytical basis, but it hasn't been done yet. David, I'll just add to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the question here. Uh, you know, gearboxes are designed to last 20 to 30 years. I think there's certain, you know, based on who the uh, gearbox manufacturer is, there's certain safety uh, uh, factors that they put on in terms of the max load that the gearbox will see. I think the big issue comes when, if you look at the traditional use of a gearbox in industrial settings or in marine settings, there's almost always somebody around the equipment that has the gearbox and can say, oh, I hear something different, or I hear a grinding noise, or I hear, I heard a pop or a bang, and the things get taken care of right away. And, you know, gearboxes that are supposed to last 20, 30 years are not supposed to be maintenance-free for 20 to 30 years. They require maintenance, even in an industrial setting. What happens in a wind turbine is, because there's nobody around, the, in the, the, the transient loads that Dave, David talks about or the shock events that happen in a gearbox go unnoticed. And once that happens and nobody takes care of a, a minor occurrence or failure that may have occurred in a gearbox over three weeks, six weeks, ten weeks, that becomes a catastrophic failure, right? So I, I, I think the... The key is not so much whether the gearboxes will last. I think they will last. I think they can last. It's detecting the maintenance issue early on for them to be able to last the 20 to 30 years. That never happens because these turbines are sitting remotely somewhere in a wind farm, right? So by having the condition monitoring packages on and analyzing the rate of change in anything that happens you know, through those sensors, I think we can prolong the life of the gearboxes with a minor maintenance event. I, I, and uh, that's a really good point, uh, Deeraj. And I think the condition monitoring has done a lot for for improving the ability to take care of, of gearboxes before they 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 self destruct. Um, but I think that the um, there's there's still this issue of what is really causing the deterioration. A, a lot of the high-speed bearings and gears on your boxes can be exchanged up, up uh, on the wind turbine, so you don't have to take the box down. The condition monitoring is very, very valuable to, to uh, doing that. Yep. Um, 
But um, I think that the use of conditioning monitoring to highlight what is what events are actually causing deterioration, uh, because some of that deterioration is happening at more than just the high speed uh, end. That's uh, right. That's right. Uh, yep, I agree. Good comments. All right, very good, gentlemen. We passed the one hour mark, but I've got a lot of questions here, so I'll just ask a couple more, okay? Um, here's one from Gary. He says, will the torque limiter eventually break in the line of duty? <laughs> it's designed to be the thing that slips and absorbs the, the shock load. And we've, <clears throat> we've been making these things for 30-some years um, to, to, take, to, to absorb the nasty shock loads. And we, um, what, we, <laughs> what we like to do is design it for the life between a major maintenance uh, period. Uh, so on, um, on underground mining equipment, we design for three to five years of life between the uh, rebuilds of the machine and, and, they, and they last. They, they're very super reliable devices. Um, in the in the wind turbine industry, we think we can design for at least a five year and maybe a ten year life between a rebuild of a of a, of a torque limiter. Um, that, that's what we've aimed the, the design at, and it's possible that after we do the testing on it and all, that we can probably get it to a twenty year life without uh, much much trouble. Uh, we do have things that we do put out that do last twenty years and very very reliable. Our, our expectation is a five-year um, inspect and a uh, ten-year rebuild replace. Okay, very good. Uh, D. Ryan, the last question will be for you. Okay, do the do the gearbox lube filtration systems remove or catch varnish in solution? Yes. Yeah, so what we have is an add-on that goes onto a gearbox lube and filtration system that does eliminate uh, or break it breaks down because the varnish is not free floating inside the uh, the oil varnish essentially stays on top of the metallic element so what we have as an add-on is a varnish removal system that goes as a, a package and that runs offline because it has no reason the varnish has no reason to come inside the gearbox lube and filtration system uh, that would break down the varnish on the uh, on the moving elements, the metal elements, and take them out. And the way that does it is it actually breaks down the varnish and coagulates the varnish into bigger particles and then sucks those particles out from the from the gearbox. Okay, very so, good. So, yes, we have that technology and that system, but it's not part of the loop system. You don't want to bring varnish into the gearbox loop system. All right, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And, and thank you, uh, and you folks in the audience. Uh, once again, the webcast will be available for reviewing at windpowerengineering.com. And one final message, you can follow Wind Power Engineering on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. All right, this concludes our presentation. I want to thank everyone else for their attention. And from the staff here at Wind Power Engineering and Development Magazine, we wish you a good and productive day. And Paul, real quick, I mean, if anybody has any more questions, uh, our emails and phone numbers are on the presentation. By all means, you know, Thank you'd be happy to respond. Yeah, did appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.